Once upon a time, there was a person who deplored the state of movies these days. They were upset that the protagonist of every film gets beaten up or defeated in some way. Not just in TV movies, not just in serious movies, not just in French foreign film movies, but also in the Hollywood comic book blockbusters, this negativity shines through. Every movie seems to start okay. Life is going well. But then the challenge arises or the villain enters and everything goes wrong. Every movie ends with the loss of love, with the victory of the villain, and the crushing defeat of the hero. And it's all just too depressing. I'm so glad they said that I never watched more than the first half. I couldn't bear to see that for the whole length of the movie. You see, the prophecy of Haggai today exhorts us not to give up on the storyline when it's only halfway through. Haggai reminds us that God's story ends with a spectacular victory. It encourages us to live that story even when times are hard. You have to stick to the end. There's no sense turning off Karate Kid when Daniel LaRusso first gets beaten up. You have to watch all the way through. You've got to watch him confused as he paints Mr. Miyagi's French. You've got to watch him uh, confused as he whacks on, whacks off. You've got to watch all the training until you get to his final stunning victory. But there are times when the good times of the past interfere with the ability to embrace the work of the present and the hope of our future. We are sometimes tempted to stop the story halfway through and to become depressed about the loss of the past. You see, the temple in Jerusalem had been a beautiful place. King Solomon had built the temple with rich resources to be the place where God would make a special dwelling on earth. You know, it was all the finest craftsmanship, the, the best materials. In the temple, God would make this special dwelling. And in the temple, God made a specific place to be available for his presence and his grace. The temple was the place where people could be sure that they could be with God, that they could communicate with God, and where God promised from that place to bless people. But Solomon's temple had been destroyed. The leaders of the land and many people had been carried off into exile. Finally, under the Persian Cyrus the Great, God had returned the people to the land, and in the reign of King Darius I, the rebuilding of the temple had begun. But we read in the book of the prophet Ezra uh, that when they gathered to celebrate the laying that sorry we read in Ezra that when they gathered to celebrate the laying of the temple's foundation here's what it says it says all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid but many of the priests and levites and the heads of fathers houses old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. The contrast for those who remembered it between the wealth of what Solomon had been able to build with all the wealth of Solomon and what now the struggling returned exiles were able to build led many to weep over the past. And then the building of the temple stalled. For about two years, apparently, nothing happened on the building of the temple. Perhaps the glories of the past were preventing the people from embracing their future. So God sent Haggai to encourage them and to get them back on track. But the first thing that he does is he points to this experience and he deals with this experience of the people. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? There are times when we may feel the same way. Do you ever feel like the state of the church or your own spiritual state is like nothing to you? You know, I don't hear people saying that, but frankly I think sometimes we're just too polite to say it. Because sometimes I get the suspicion that we think it. 
We may not say it aloud, but we sometimes act as if there's nothing worth working for anymore. It's easy to feel that we're not on the winning side. The society, societal position of the church is gone, and with it, all the glory. It's all too easy to look back on past days and compare how many people were in the church back then, or how big our Sunday school was, and lament for the loss of those times. I mean, honestly, even COVID's been a kind of depressing time, not just for society generally, but in the church. There are fewer people in churches now than there were before COVID. Perhaps it seems that prayer was more fervent, or worship was more enriching, or people were more dedicated back then, and there probably were more of us. But we can also feel that in individual lives. I myself can look back on particular times in my life when prayer did seem more rewarding, where I seemed better at that, or where I felt particularly close to God, or I was managing one or other uh, aspects of uh, discipleship or ministry so much better than I do now. You know, look back on the golden age and go, somehow it was just easier to do back then. Many of us lament that, you know, we used to have so much energy and capacity that enabled us to do more than we can now. And most people, I think, remember things that appear like a golden age. Like my theory is that most of us, once we've lived life in the church for a while, have a kind of rosy glow around one or other era in the church. It's kind of like a golden age for us. There may have been a particular Bible study where we grew a lot, were particularly close to others, there are particular Christian friends who changed what our experience of living the faith was like, or particular leaders or pastors, and I'll hear about it because they always seem better than the current leader or pastor. <laughs> and that's true at all age groups. I've always been fascinated by how uh, young adults sometimes discount how good their own generation is when they compare themselves to those who are five or six years older than them. To those who, the, the, the current youth leaders compare themselves and say, well, we're not as good as the leaders who were there when we were in youth. It's possible even as a teenager sometimes to look back and go, wow, I wish I had the enthusiasm of those kids. And of course, as an adult, you look back and think, I wish I had the enthusiasm that I had when I was a teenager. In all these ways, we're tempted to be like the people of Haggai's day. We might look back on the beauties of the temple or the, or the church or our own past and we conclude that today's church or our spiritual life is nothing at all. But the word of the Lord came to the people through the prophet Haggai. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you. This is what I covenanted when I came when I came, sorry, when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is a message that redeems the present. There are certain things that we had in the past, but we don't have now. We may not have that position in society, or the numbers, or that spiritual blessing, in particular, or, or energy that we had in the past. For Haggai's day, it was the temple of Solomon that they didn't have. But the one thing that really mattered, they did still have, and that was the presence of God himself. The people were all too prone to confuse the blessings of God with the presence of God. And to turn even the temple actually into some sort of idol. They placed so much importance on the temple as the place where, in all its glory, as the place where God would be, that they missed the fact that God was with them anyway, even without the temple. So much importance on the, what had served God in the past that they'd come to a complete standstill on serving God in the present. But Haggai calls them back to understand that the blessings of God that really count are still theirs and God assures us today in this word that his blessings are still ours. God promises that as hard as things might seem in our church, for the church in our society, for this congregation in its history, for our daily lives, he is with us. 
the covenantal promise he has made to us in Christ's to us, and his steadfast loyalty and his mercy to us endure. As even the book of Lamentations says, and Lamentations, of course, the very name tells you that it was written in the midst of incredible pain and agony, but it nevertheless still says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Moreover, God promised the people of Israel, and in an even richer way, promises us through Christ, my spirit remains among you. The Holy Spirit of God who gives faith, who empowers us with the fruit of the Spirit for character, gifts of the Spirit for service, is still with us today. And so the prophecy concludes, do not fear. The things that really matter are still ours because God is still ours and we are his. Now that doesn't mean that life is always going to be easy or that we'll always be able to live as disciples of Jesus without effort or without opposition. But what it means is that God is with us and that is enough. As Joshua entered the promised land back at the beginning of Israel's history, God spoke to him and said, meditate on my teaching and do it and you will have good success. That's a paraphrase, by the way. This is a quote. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. David encouraged Solomon to build the first temple using those same words. Be strong and courageous and do it. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God, even my God, is with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And Haggai encouraged the building of the second temple with the same words. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Do not be afraid. You see, the problem that we face today may not be that we don't have the riches of the past. The problem we face today may be our longing for the things that we once had, that our weeping over the past sometimes drowns out our joy what God is doing in the present moment. Sometimes we're tempted to down tools, to stop trying to build the kingdom of God because it seems that things are not as good as they once were. I've got to say, my experience is that this is working itself out in a lot of pastors at the moment. You know, congregations are kind of a bit depressed and, and of course the, con the pastor owns all that for himself and so pastors are kind of a bit depressed. And so the temptation is to kind of give up along the way. But God is still with us. His spirit remains with us. His covenantal promises are still true. God calls us back to see that his faithfulness remains, that he empowers us by his spirit and there's no reason to be afraid. He calls us then to be strong, be courageous and work. Joshua, Solomon, the people that Haggai spoke to all had a task for their day. And God's assurance of his presence with them was therefore also a call to do the work to which God had called them. The same is true of us. We're not to be so wrapped up in the, in the work of the past that we miss the joy, the joy of the work in the present. It may not look the way it once did. There are times and places for God's specific blessings and they don't always look the same in every time and place. But we can be sure that he is with us and his mercies are new every morning. We ought not to spend so much time in mourning. We miss the mercies of this morning. For our children, our teenagers, our young adults, this is also a reminder that God doesn't just work with adults. God wasn't just at work in the world, 
just at the time when sort of you know when my dad was young, you know, back, despite the fact that dad constantly says things were better in the old days, the reality is is that God is equally present with our young people, and it's a reminder to those of us who are getting on and, and a little bit prone to talking about the old days that that God is still with us now. It wasn't like God has left us alone. God indeed has a purpose for building his kingdom among us in the present. The way things were is not the way things are, and God may not just repeat those things, but God is still with us. He still has work for us to do. But Haggai not only assures the people of God's presence with them in the present moment, but the second half of our text today points ahead to the greater future. Sometimes it seems like Christians aren't on the winning side, but Haggai assures us that actually we are. The victory, only the final victory, is the victory. And that belongs to us in God. God promised the people that the future would unveil a time that would be greater than the past. In declarations, the Lord, through the Lord, uh, through Haggai, the Lord promises, I will shake all the nations, and what is desired by every nation will come, and I will fill this house with glory. The silver and the gold is mine, says the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, and in this place I will grant peace. The New Testament book of Hebrews quotes this passage and says that it points ahead to God's final dealing with the world. And indeed, first the rabbis themselves, and then Christians alike have noted that what is desired by all nations in this text could well be a reference to the Messiah. This is a messianic prophecy that God promises here to exhibit his glory, that is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's many perfections in an even greater way than in that first temple and to bring about peace and well-being. Now I could unwrap in great detail why it's happened but Christians for many generations have seen here the promise of Jesus. They've seen this greater glory coming to the second temple as the moment when Jesus, God himself, visits the second temple. And even if that's not directly what Haggai means in this passage, it certainly points us ahead to the fulfillment that we have in Jesus. We're reminded that no matter what happens in the present, no matter how messy it is now, God's future is great and God's future is guaranteed. So we wait for the time when all of God's promises are yes in Christ. You cannot lose by investing yourself in faith in God and in faithful living because God has promised the future. Indeed, God has promised eternity to those who do that. And so it turns out that sometimes our attitude to the present can be terribly wrong. We sometimes think we've reached the end of the movie as if we are sort of the, the highlight and ending of all history. We think that the past was the highlight, that everything was downhill from there. We're tempted to give up on building the place of God on earth because it will never be what it once was. But thinking like that is wrong because God's story still continues. We mustn't check out before the best part. We mustn't be defeatist before we are defeated. Only the final victory will be final. God says to us, be strong, do not be afraid, and work, for I am with you. We may yet need to undergo some kind of training montage. We may yet still have things to achieve and difficulties to face, but the God that we know in Christ is with us, his spirit remains with us so that there is still good work to do. We thank God for the blessings of the past. We can be honest about our sadness at the passing of some of those things. But we cannot be downcast because the really important thing is that God is still with us. More than that, even when we are in the darkest of days, God still promises that our future with him will be full of his glory. Second Thessalonians rings some of these same notes. It assures us of our past that our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loved us. 
He assures us of our future because by his grace he has given us eternal encouragement and good hope. And it says of our present that God is with us because he will, by his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. So the word of the Lord through Haggai speaks to each one of you here today. Be strong and work, for I am with you. This is my covenant and my spirit remains among you. Do not be afraid. Amen.